You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and on Agriculture Today, a visiting researcher to the College of Agriculture, more specifically the Department of Agronomy at Kansas State, which each year hosts what's called the Roscoe Ellis Lectureship, named after the longtime soil scientist here at Kansas State. And it focuses in on various contemporary topics in the area of soil science. The 2011 Roscoe Ellis Lecture is Sally Brown. She is from the University of Washington, an associate professor there, and in the Ecosystem Science Division of the Forest Resources College at the University of Washington in Seattle. Sally, welcome to you and to Kansas State, first of all. Thank you for inviting me and having me here. We want to talk about your research specialty here, which is soil remediation by using what are called residuals. We'll get into all that, but allow us a bit of your background, if you would. I have an unusual background for a soil scientist. <laughs> I started out, uh, I grew up in New York City, uh, went to high school in Manhattan, um, and as a high school student had memorized the city subway system but knew absolutely nothing about the soils except that it was my job to cut the hedges. <laughs> um, I grew up in Queens and then after graduate, graduating from a liberal arts college I worked as a cook for many years in New York City and ended up starting a produce business in New York City growing with locally grown produce delivered to stores and restaurants and started working with farmers and started realizing how much I loved working with farmers and at the same time how much I liked being in the city as well. So I ended up deciding to go back to graduate school to work with biosolids primarily which is the solid fertile material that you get from wastewater treatment as a way to link cities to farms around them and strengthen to strengthen urban and rural ties. Mm -hmm. So um, went to graduate school and found out that you can't just put biosolids on strawberries. There's in some cases you can, but that it doesn't always work like that and ended up realizing that there were a lot of concerns about using these materials. And some of these concerns had to do with the metal concentrations in the materials. Um, did master's and PhD research on metal availability in long-term biosolids amended soils and saw that you could use biosolids, normally produced biosolids, and end up with better yields and lower metal concentrations than in control soils. Mm. Ended up starting to work with using biosolids in combination with other waste materials um, to restore metal contaminated sites. Did a lot of work with the Superfund program, um, which is some of the most rewarding stuff I've ever done, taking um, lands that had been barren for 70, 80, 90 and up years and making them lush again mm -hmm. and all with these biosolids that people were terrified of using. So I went, most of the research that has traditionally been done on these materials has been to evaluate risks associated with their use. Mm -hmm. And I started realizing, wait a second, we're talking about risks. You have a material here that's produced every day in every city across the country that has the capacity to turn these devastated lands to the point back to life to the point where the the owners of the lands one of the ranchers in Leadville Colorado for example had his whole life not grown anything on half of his pasture because of metal contamination and by the time we finished the work on his ranch he was fighting with the EPA officer about what kind of yields he should be expecting mm. So maybe it's time to rethink how we look at these materials and look at benefits associated with these materials. And so I made a big switch in my research focus. How did these materials, how are they best used? How can we get the most out of something that had been considered a waste? It really is classic recycling, isn't it, in the biological sense? And you make some every day. One of the things I learned when I first went back to grad school and was taking basic soils was the old farm model where you had not a thousand head of cattle, but enough cows and some pigs and some chickens and not um, a thousand acres, but a smaller section. And a lot of the waste materials from the animals and from the household were recycled back onto the soil. As our ag systems are changing and as the urban environment gets more and more isolated from the agricultural or rural environments, you're seeing that that, that whole cycle of bringing things back to the soil has been broken. And for me, one of my big goals in life is to bring that cycle back when nitrogen fertilizers and phosphorus fertilizers were 
limitless and more is better. Now we're in a stage where we're starting to realize the limits of these resources and that in fact we can't afford to waste or at least from my perspective we're past a point where we can afford to waste these materials. So it's time to take these urban areas where populations are increasingly concentrated and start bringing back an understanding of natural cycles and natural systems so that people can understand, wait, this isn't garbage. This is a really important resource, resource that we need to conserve. And that's what I do. <laughs> is the major challenge in this area currently the infrastructure that is getting biosolids from point A to useful point B out on the land? I think... <sighs> There's a, a number of different answers to this. The way that the infrastructure has been developed, it's all centralized waste treatment. Cases like in Seattle where I live, the biosolids are used for dryland wheat, for hops, um, for a commercial tree farm. We have a lot of dug fir plantations in the woods. Um, and so it's, it's a very viable, successful program. But what's also happened is the the millions and millions of people like me that grew up in these urban areas, the ones that grew up without any tie to natural systems, are terrified of natural systems. They don't know from natural systems. So you have um, the biggest threat to me to reuse of a range of materials is general ignorance on the part of the urban public. They don't know what this is. They're scared. It has stuff in it. Mm -hmm. um, right now, current things that are big, big concerns for the average urban person, and I get questions on this all the time. I get questions on antimicrobial compounds and biosolids. <laughs> now, if you look at the Colgate website, you can see that Colgate toothpaste is advertising that they have triclosan in their toothpaste. So people are buying this because it has this. And on the other hand, they're terrified that there's some of this in their soil system. It's a difficult disconnect, isn't it? It's amazing, the disconnect. So I think what's really important is to start getting people that have been so separated from soils from plants from natural systems and how nature works and cycles back to understanding these systems and then you'll get over the fears and then you'll get to a point where you can recognize a resource so even though for example in Seattle the biosolids are very much appreciated and you have big wait lists for them in dryland wheat production I think it's really essential that people in the city start sticking their hand in the biosolids seeing what it can do for an urban garden and so um, much to my surprise, I'm doing more work with urban uses mm -hmm. of these materials than I would have predicted. And I'm starting to think more and more that in order for you to have a successful beneficial use program, a portion of that needs to be in the cities themselves. Looking at this from the larger production agriculture perspective, though, what are the challenges in utilizing more biosolids bio out on the larger landscapes and, and uh, the producer receptiveness to the idea. Is that an obstacle to overcome? Um, you know, the farmers that I've worked with, uh, so for example, um, Washington State has the wet side of the Cascades and the dry side of the Cascades. And the dry side of the Cascades um, has a lot of large-scale production agriculture. Um, what we see in the dryland wheat is that if there's sufficient rain, and we're talking about 12 inches a year, uh, so it is very much dryland wheat, um, the biosolids applied at agronomic rates will outyield conventional fertilizers. So for the farmers, there's a wait list for materials. It's the generators that are terrified of public opposition to use of these materials. So once a farmer has started using biosolids, you start having farmers fight for the right to get biosolids. And there have actually been lawsuits in Virginia, right to farm, as a way to say, no, you can't take away my materials. Mm. But in other cases, the municipalities, they're so afraid of the public that they don't let general farmers use these materials. Um, City of Denver has a farm that they farm and they do very little application to farmers outside of the land that they have purchased. On the other hand, in Colorado, there's a company called Parker Ag that manages biosolids for New York City and Boston. Mm. They get railed in and there again you have plenty of farmers willing to take material. Um, another example, and um, this may be pertinent 
here in Kansas. Um, one system that we looked at a couple of years back, and it's it's nice for me because things have actually happened as a result of this. Um, with the big push towards biofuels, one of the major impacts of biofuels is the heavy use of fertilizers required for biofuels. We started a program that was funded by USDA looking at biosolids to fertilize canola for biodiesel production. A lot of um, animals a lot of dairy cows in Washington state as well and the canola meal is a good food source it's a protein source that's had been imported from Canada and because of this field site that we started um, we now have one farmer in Washington state another in Oregon they each manage a good portion of the biosolids within the state and they each are growing biodiesel fertilized with biosolids it is very interesting work indeed, Sally, and we appreciate not only your time here with us, but you coming to Kansas State and sharing a lot of these ideas on biosolids as soil amendments at the uh, Roscoe Ellis Lectureship here at K-State. So thank you, and uh, good luck in your endeavors. Well, thank you for having me. Her name is Sally Brown. She is a research associate professor with the Ecosystem Science Division, the College of Forest Resources at the University of Washington here on the K-State campus this week, sharing the Roscoe Ellis Lecture, where she's talking of, by title, the new McDonald, the Royal of Soil Science and Urban Sustainability. You're listening to Agriculture Today. More in a moment on the K-State Radio Network.